All right. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to this workshop. Um, so here's the title of the workshop. When I just first got the idea of uh, organizing it, I came up with the title. And I love complicated titles, as you can see. But I think it kind of summarizes our vision for the workshop. Um, and I think it's going to be, we're really excited. So my co-organizers are um, Christine Hawks. She's in back here, and Chris Klausmeyer. Um, so we brainstormed hard, we wrote a proposal, and we invited um, you, the brilliant minds, for this workshop. Um, so I think it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, so basically, uh, we'll start uh, with um, sort of an introduction that will help us uh, get on the same page because we have so many disciplines, um, so many systems here. So I think it's one of the most interdisciplinary workshops. Um, and I think it has some challenges because we'll have to find a common ground. So, but I think uh, it is doable. So the major goals for this workshop is first to, um, well, understand what, what it is we're going to talk about, find common ground, then basically um, sort of a more ambitious uh, goal here to define a new field. I don't know, maybe um, I'm thinking too ambitiously. Maybe there isn't a new field, but maybe there is. Uh, so then uh, we would like to formulate key questions and develop ways to address them. And I sent around the proposal, so we put in some questions. And those are definitely not um, set in stone. Um, we expect input um, in formulating, reformulating them. But I think they will help, these questions will help us focus our discussions. And um, a, a pretty ambitious goal is to produce actually some kind of a synthesis, um, an idea paper. And so uh, Chris was talking about, uh, Chris Walsh was talking about the um, sort of the metrics of success for Nimbus and one of the most important metrics is publications, and of course for everyone um, here, um, publications are important. But I think we'll be able, not just produce a, a publications for the metrics, right? But I think we'll be able to say something new and exciting that the field uh, or other researchers will benefit from. And I think that we should keep that in mind. And I think it will help us focus our discussions. And I'm, I'm really hopeful and I'm very excited by the breadth of expertise here. So I think it's going to be really great. And I see like, all friendly faces. I think we'll get along very well. And uh, uh, although I don't know, we don't know um, most of you guys, um, I think it'll be very exciting and uh, productive. So, so that's the team, and Chris, Chris made me put the slide in. I don't know like how many people play video games. It's like one of the popular video games. I don't play it, <laughs> Team Fortress 2. But anyway, we have, uh, we have a very powerful team here. So I would like to start uh, with sort of a discussion, brief discussion, uh, why are trade-based approaches important? And uh, probably, uh, Many of us have thought about trades and trade-based approaches, but we, I'm sure, each have a slightly different vision or maybe a greatly different vision of what trades are and what trade-based approaches are. So um, I will uh, present our view and uh, then we'll have discussions and uh, we'll see whether those views are universal or they have to be tweaked um, and how we're going to um, accomplish that. So um, a lot of trade-based research comes from uh, p terrestrial plant ecology, and they're very far ahead of other uh, systems. And I think uh, maybe it's easier for them, for terrestrial plant people, because traits are so simple. It's like specific leaf area. That's, that's a cool trait. It's easy to measure. Um, but maybe it's not as useful for uh, some things, and maybe microbial people have some advantages, and I think we do over uh, terrestrial plant people. Uh, but I think it's, it's always nice to kind of uh, keep in mind what other fields have achieved. And so um, they've done a lot in tra developing trade-based approaches. 
So uh, a lot of people in uh, terrestrial plant ecology are interested in succession. And so if you think in microbial systems, we also can observe uh, succession of species. So some species wax and wane, and uh, it can be a sort of an unpredictable mass if you look at it, like basically um, uh, outright. But, and then you start thinking what are the species that wax and wane? And for primary succession, I'm sure everyone had learned it or most of you had learned it in, in undergraduate ecology classes. So uh, we first have, let's say it's a primary succession. We've, we have bare ground colonized by lichens and then we have shrubs and then trees, right? I'm not, I'm not a plant person, so <laughs> it's a very simplistic diagram. And, um, so, and then it's hard to understand why we have this succession of species. And so one thing to be more mechanistic about it is to look at uh, characteristics of these different species um, or their traits. And so if you think that uh, initially species that colonize bare ground are poor light competitors, so they require a lot of light and then they thrive on the open ground. And they're good nutrient competitors because very often barren ground um, has very low nutrient content. And as time goes by, uh, there is a change in main attributes or main traits of species. So these species get replaced by good light competitors and poor nutrient competitors as nutrients accumulate and light availability decreases. So when you focus on traits of species, you begin to understand the mechanisms beyond the, uh, behind the species replacement. So we think that these sort of this focus on traits of different species, different microbial species, can help us understand community structure, community assembly in microbes. And so uh, trait-based approaches have this advantage, have several advantages. And I think uh, these advantages are applicable very readily to microbial systems. So the focus is on functional traits and not on species per se. So you're much more mechanistic when you're focusing on traits. So, and then, um, as I said, they focusing on traits, on functional traits can help identify mechanisms structuring communities. And it can also help reduce complexity because you don't have to keep track of every species in your multi-species community. You just focus on traits that matter. And of course, traits that would matter will depend on the question that you're asking. And so uh, this trait-based approach can help us link ecological strategies, <coughs> functional diversity in microbes and other systems, and try to understand community assembly mechanistically. So uh, major questions, uh, I just put uh, these questions from the proposal, and I think they can help us uh, focus our discussion. And uh, so one of the goals for today would be to uh, discuss these questions and tweak them, maybe add new questions, and uh, try to define the discussion realm for the next couple of days. So what are key traits and microbes that transcend all taxa? Basically, we have representatives here, we have people who are studying very different microbes. For example, I study mostly phytoplankton, marine phototrophic organisms. Many of you study bacteria, some of you study fungi. fungi. So whether there are traits that transcend these different taxa? And I'm sure the answer is yes, of course, but it would be very interesting to come up with the list of these traits and maybe have some hierarchy of these traits. So, and of course, we shouldn't forget about taxon-specific traits, like how much should we focus on them? What are those taxon-specific traits? And then the big question, how do we measure those traits? And in microbes, it's difficult. Probably very often we'll have to resort to inferring traits. Inferring traits maybe from genomes or metabolic networks. And how is it possible? So, and then uh, we need to discuss how these traits can be incorporated into mathematical models. Because uh, mathematical models can help us be more predictive and understand the mechanisms better. And we're at Nimbus, we have to discuss uh, mathematical approaches. And I'm very excited uh, uh, 
by this group because we have mathematical people, we have mathematicians in here, and we have people who do both math and biology. So, and uh, my one of my favorite topics it is what are the trade-offs among traits? Because you know, none of the organisms can do it all very well, right? So there are trade-offs, and so these trade-offs can shape can help shape strategies, different ecological strategies. So uncovering these trade-offs will really help us understand the mechanisms of community assembly and different strategies in microbes, and uh, whether we can derive both traits and those trade-offs from first principles or from genomes or subcellular characteristics. So these are really important questions. And uh, we shouldn't forget about trait evolution. So traits aren't set in stone, they are fluid. And how much fluidity is there? So we have horizontal gene transfer, so the traits change. So can we model this trait evolution? How do we do that? So these are, these are some of the questions that we felt uh, were important and crucial to sort of uh, focus our discussion and uh, are important for the field. So uh, to start with like, what is a trait? Everyone asks like, what is a trait? Pretty much, well, uh, anything that you can measure, right? So you, you may not realize, but you've been doing trait-based approaches uh, all along, right? So uh, one of the definitions from, again, from uh, terrestrial plant ecology is uh, that trait is any single feature or quantifiable measurement of an organism. And uh, a lot of people talk about heritability of traits. So, and another important definition is uh, functional traits, and usually those are traits that affect fitness or performance in general. So, for example, a uh, maximum growth rate of an organism could be an important trait because fitness is, uh, growth rate is uh, often a, a proxy for fitness. And so another um, useful, I think, uh, categorization of traits uh, that comes again from terrestrial plant ecology is so-called uh, response and effect traits. And so uh, the way you can view these different traits is when you look at certain environmental driver and it would affect how an organism responds to this environmental driver. And those would be response traits. For example, I already mentioned growth rate could be uh, a response trait and then response traits are linked to effect traits. And effect traits are those traits that affect, that influence ecosystem functioning. For example, well, one of my favorite traits is nitrogen fixation, and I think nitrogen fixation can be both a response trait and an effect trait, right? So it responds to how much nitrogen there is in the environment, and also it will affect how much nitrogen will be uh, gained by the, by the environment. Let's say nitrogen fixation in the open ocean by, uh, by cyanobacteria. So uh, there are traits that could be both and there are traits that could be one or the other. So this is an interesting categorization of traits. So you can classify traits uh, differently and so here is a, f a table of how we could classify phytoplankton traits um, from an old paper of ours. And so basically I wanted to uh, point out that, so you can classify traits, I don't know whether pointer is, uh, by ecological function. And so major functions could be reproduction, resource acquisition, and predator avoidance for a lot of organisms, including microbes. And you can think about different trait types. So life history traits, behavioral traits, physiological traits, morphological traits, maybe genomic traits. And so the list of traits can be huge. And of course, we shouldn't be considering probably all of them at once. Um, we could choose traits that matter for a particular question. And so uh, here's some compilation of these traits that could be found in both heterotrophic bacteria and phytoplankton. And I'm sure we can add a lot of different traits to this table, but I'll just read a few traits so that you kind of get an idea what different people mean by traits. 
So sell or body size is sort of a, a very, uh, people call it a master trait. And uh, so coloniality, it could be present even in bacteria. So genome size and organization. So proportion of functional genes and number of copies of those genes, introns, transposons, and others. So mutation rate can be an important trait because it could depend, uh, it could determine the evolutionary potential for uh, organisms. So maximum growth rate, both at the population or individual level. So metabolic or photosynthesis rate, respiration rate, maximum resource acquisition rate. So resource storage or reserve form and capacity and so forth. So I have this, uh, a bunch of traits and I can share the, this table for our discussions. So we can cross some traits out or add new ones. So for microbes, it's really exciting to think about traits at different levels of organization. I think for terrestrial plants, it's kind of much more convoluted and complicated. At least, I, I th well, it's, it's pretty convoluted and complicated for microbes as well. But I think in the proposal we said, for microbes, it's slightly easier <laughs> than for multicellular organisms. So we have genomes, and we know a lot about micro microbial genomes, right? So, and we know a lot about cellular metabolic networks, and we know something about phenotypic traits, and I call phenotypic traits, let's say, um, the rate of uptake of some resource, for example, and um, s there are many other traits. And we know something about community structure, and we know something about ecosystem dynamics and the role of microbes in those. But putting it all together and determining the links between these different levels or, of organization is still difficult, right? For example, is it possible to derive rates of nutrient uptake from the metabolic information of your microbe, right? Is it possible? Can we... Uh, define how we uh, establish this link, or the link between genomes and metabolism. So, and then going higher in complexity or in level of organization, how can these phenotypic traits be translated into community structure and succession, let's say, or community assembly? And what traits are important for ecosystem dynamics? So putting it all together, I think, is exciting and challenging, and I hope we can uh, come up with, uh, with some ideas how to do it um, during this workshop. And so uh, I said trade-offs are important, so we shouldn't forget about that. And so there are uh, pairwise trade-offs. For example, you can have a trade-off between maximum growth rate and growth efficiency. It's a common trade-off in, in microbes and bacteria. And for phytoplankton, we talk we think about a lot about trade-offs between competitive abilities for different resources. So, and trade-offs could be linear, they could be non-linear, and that really uh, is important for uh, understanding interactions of, of uh, microbes, of organisms. And Ken is going to talk about um, traits and trade-offs, right, um, later today. And so, uh, we should think about also um, about multi-dimensional trade-offs. So it's not only pairwise trade-offs, but trade-offs in higher dimensions. And so here is um, a graph of a three-way trade-off between the competitive ability for nitrogen, competitive ability for phosphorus, and grazer resistance for phytoplankton. So and basically uh, all these different species fall on the same trade-off plane. So I don't know if how many of you can think about uh, four-dimensional trade-offs or multi-dimensional trade-offs. It's something to, to think about to keep things interesting, I think. Um, so, and of course, uh, modeling traits uh, and using trait-based models is an important component of our discussion. So, and, and Chris could uh, talk a little bit about that. followed the instructions for getting the microphone on correctly. 
that good? All right. So um, traditional e ecological models, um, we deal with just a small number of species, put each one in a box, have a small set of ordinary differential equations, and we can deal with it maybe analytically, maybe numerically. Um, the problem in nature is that we've got many more species than we have boxes in our models. So we could keep on adding more and more boxes, um, but this runs into computational problems. But even worse is, you know, trying to put some order on this system because each one of these arrows here denotes some kind of flux, some kind of uh, rate. So these should have parameter values associated with them. Um, and we don't want to just arrange them willy-nilly. We want to put them in some order. Um, and there's also variation within species. So there's no limit to the number of boxes um, you can put in. So we take it to the limit in trait-based approaches. We take a continuum limit. And instead of looking at a large, finite number of boxes, we deal instead with a continuum. And as we've learned from problems in physics, sometimes this is actually easier to deal with. And so then we can think of, you know, the universe of possible species, strategies as, you know, this continuous uh, space where the axes are defined by these ecophysiological functional traits. And this is basically my, my idea of what the trait-based perspective is all about. It's a way to um, reduce the dimensionality of a system um, so that it's more tractable mathematically and also conceptually. Um, we can look at this from two directionals, um, the forward modeling, the statistical modeling. I'm just going to focus a little bit on the top arrow there. Um, just some, some ideas on how people have addressed trait-based modeling in populations, communities, ecosystems, and evolution. Um, so the simplest approach is this, where in a given environment, um, the environment plus species traits determine their growth rate. Okay. Um, population dynamics, exponential growth. Um, this is the simplest possible case. So if you have a given environment, you find the trait combination that maximizes your exponential growth rate, that's what evolution should be after. So this is kind of, you know, you only need some first-year calculus for this optimization approach. Um, the problem with it is it's a little bit too simple. I mean, we've gotten a lot of insights from such approaches, but it's too simple. And there's always, you know, a best species. So it doesn't allow any diversity that we see in nature. So instead, we need to close this feedback loop where population growth rate actually translates into changes in population sizes, which then have a feedback on the environment. So once you allow this feedback loop, then we're outside of optimization, and you can pull in ideas from evolutionary game theory. Um, there's one case with this feedback loop that's still amenable to optimization. That's resource competition for one limiting factor, in which case you want to you know, find the combination of traits that would minimize your break-even nutrient concentration, uh, Tillman's R star. But in general, you know, there is no such... Um, extremum principle that you can use. So instead, this is what you can, this is one, one approach. Um, so first of all, you start out with a mechanistic <coughs> model of population dynamics in a community context. And in this example, we're going to look at uh, community assembly or evolution within the phytoplankton, uh, let's call them guild or functional group. So this is just a standard traditional box model, as in ecology. But then we have to generalize um, our focal level to an arbitrary number of species. Um, it's pretty easy. Add subscripts to parameters and uh, summations here. So the traits in this perspective could be, in an ideal case, you choose your traits so that they represent rate parameters in your ecological model. And these ones here in the per capita growth rate of your focal uh, guild, these are the response traits. These parameters down here, these are the effect traits, what they're doing to resources and grazers. Next, you identify fitness in this context. And uh, Hans Metz and colleagues have shown that this is basically per capita growth rate. 
And then we try and look for a so-called evolutionarily stable strategy. We put in a trial species, let it go to its long-term attractor, calculate the growth rate when rare of any other type trying to invade it. Um, if that's negative, invasion fails. If it's positive, invasion succeeds. And general, there's replacement of the former resident by the invader. So this indicates that there would be directional selection pushing this uh, species to have a larger trait value. And what we're after then is a species along this trait axis that there is where there is no directional selection. So they're at a fitness maximum. And this would represent an endpoint of evolution or community assembly. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, um, it's not always so simple. Um, you may not find that there is an evolutionarily stable strategy. Instead, you could find that there's a spot along here where there's no directional selection, but instead there's uh, disruptive selection. It could be invaded by anyone else. And this just indicates that, you know, your community, your ecosystem needs more than one species to like close it up. Um, instead, and that will lead to diversity in the system, instead you might find there's a two species evolutionarily stable strategy. So this is one approach coming from evolutionary game theory called adaptive dynamics. It's been pretty popular um, over the last 20 years. This is kind of the Ur text uh, on it, so it's a great paper if you want to see the details. But there are a lot of different trait-based modeling approaches that are, you know, they look on the surface, they might look dissimilar. But when you dig into them, there are a lot of similarities between them. Uh, the main difference is how they assume new, the, the input of new variation, where it comes from. Um, you know, these guys more or less assume everything is everywhere. Um, this is your standard kind of quantitative genetics where you have a lot of loci with additive effects. Adaptive dynamics assumes, you know, very rare mutations of small effect um, and so on. So anyways, the point is there are a lot of different mathematical frameworks that we can use for translating from traits to populations, communities in an evolutionary context. And I think now I turn this back over to Elena. We still have a question <laughs> still. <laughs> so the questions that we have to um, try answering. And uh, so I don't know. Uh, now I have uh, just like uh, wanted to go over the re workshop agenda. But, uh, but maybe like you guys have questions before then, questions um, about trade-based approaches, like quick questions. Yeah, uh -huh. all right, excellent. <laughs> oh, yeah, great idea. Although, like, we'll have formal introductions, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, we could um, definitely, so this afternoon we'll be putting in, we could put in more questions and maybe focusing some of the existing questions. But yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, like, so because we have such wealth of data and how do we derive maybe traits or like, you know, from, from those data. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So we shouldn't forget. And the, I think the advantage of uh, microbial trait-based approaches is that we have, we're, I think drowning in, in, in these data, the genomic data and um, others, right? So, yeah, that's a great point. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, my name's Holly Muller. I'm a new assistant professor at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and I think we'll probably talk more about this this afternoon, but thinking about the multi-dimensional trait trade-offs, 
I think a challenge and potentially interesting avenue might be to think about whether there's some currency that we can boil these things down to, whether it's your energy availability in the cell or something that can be used as a denominator and then drawing from that pool. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Any other questions? All right. 